Good morning, The Way World Outreach. I'm so glad to be back here with my family. And I was so glad to go to Uganda to meet some of our new family. And if you're watching, we love you. Welcome home. Um, I do have a scripture. And it says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You know what? It's not all about a monetary thing. When you're poor in spirit and you know that you need God, that everything that you have is because you need God and you have it from him, then you're rich. Then you know that the kingdom of heaven is ours. And so I just want to say that um, we had a wonderful time over in Uganda. The people are amazing. They're so friendly and grateful and welcoming. And if you look at anybody, they have a smile for you. They have joy to give you. And I was just so glad to be part of the team that we went with and um, is amazing. I wish every one of us could go, um, but God is so good. And one more thing, I remember when um, Pastor Marco was speaking to you know some of the pastors there before we had our little conference on Friday, all they could say is, wow, 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 Pastor, I've never heard that before. Wow, I've never heard that before. Oh, I've never heard that before. So we came with a good news message, and they love Jesus, but there were some things that they had never heard before. So thank you, Jesus, that we were able to go. Love you guys. Amen. I am so glad you're here today with us. And for some of us, is we're in different places of faith. Some of you are coming here for the first time. You've never been in church or you've never been to this church. Some of us have been here a long period of time. But the key is that today we open our minds and our hearts to God's word. Uh, many of us want positive change in our lives, but it begins with receiving a word from God and allowing that message to change your thinking. That means if, you're cha if your thinking doesn't change today, after hearing the word of God, your life doesn't change. We're not here to hear a word for somebody else. Have you ever been in church and said to yourself, I wish that person was here? But be careful that you don't spend the whole time that you're ever in church hoping, wishing that they were here. You're here. And your marriage will never change. Your life will never change until your mind changes. The Bible says to put on the mind of Christ. The idea of being in the house of God is hearing the word of God, believing what it says, and receiving it. Someone say, hear it, believe it, and then receive it. How do you know you're actually receiving a word from God? This is how you know you're receiving a word. You can repeat it. If You know you've received the gossip when you receive it. Did you hear what happened to so-and-so? Oh, my gosh. Some of us receive gossip, and you could even receive a negative word over yourself, and you repeat it over yourself. You're nothing. It's never going to change. It's always the same. Oh, my gosh, it's getting worse. That was a straw that broke the camel's back. You're just negative speaking over yourself. And as long as you keep speaking negative over yourself, this is what's going to happen. Negative is coming your way. Be careful that your dream is not your dream. You have a dream. You have a vision. is not betrayed by your mouth. If your, your life is never going to change until you start speaking, change in your life. And then you have change in your life. You need a resurrection. You need a breakthrough. You need a healing. Start praising God and start speaking about your future, not your past and your present. Give God some praise. He's a good, good God. We're here to change. We're here to receive. And then we're here to give it. Thank you, Lisa. Give Lisa a hand. She's awesome. Best wife in the world. Love you, mama. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to your new family members, our church in Uganda, Africa. This is what's going to happen. This is what's happening right now. We're in partnership with them. We talked about covenant. Covenant is a word that God uses to establish a relationship. And when you're in covenant with people, two lives become one. Two ministries become one. It's like the marriage covenant. Two lives become one. And this is what we're saying. Everything we have, all our riches that we have, 
now belong to Uganda, to the orphanage. This is what they can say. We're not alone anymore. There is no lack because there's some people in America that love us and haven't forgotten about us, and we're in covenant forever. Those orphans will never be in lack again. They'll never be in hungry, hungry again. They'll never, be, they'll never be abandoned again. Their lives are being transformed right now. This is their last stop. We are going to be them with them until Jesus comes back. Until we die, we're in it. What's happened now is the church in Uganda is finally getting some relief. The orphans that we adopted the orphanage, they're getting relief right now. The, they were abandoned once by their parents or a lot of their parents died because of AIDS and all kinds of other things. There, a lot of them were street kids that were abandoned on the streets. We've opened this home. It's established already. We're right now adopting that home into the Way World Outreach. These little boys and little girls, I'm going to introduce you to them. You're going to see a picture of them today. They are now our family. But this is what was happening. The church that actually built the orphanage and, and built the church, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building this out for this church in Uganda. And they just ran out of funds and they couldn't support it anymore. They heard about the Way World Outreach and they just made a call. They tried to give it to the denomination and the denomination says, we really can't help. Um, so he was, the, the orphans were going to be abandoned one more time. But somehow the call came to us. And this is what we did. We said yes right away. We didn't think, we're not going to say, we're not praying about it. We said yes. We showed up in Uganda after a 24-hour trip down there. Another five-hour drive to the orphanage. And these little boys, we were able, little girls, we were able to hug them. We were able to touch them. And we let them know, you're never going to be abandoned again. We're family for life. Let's give God some praise that we get to love them. So today, what I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about a lesson that I learned or lessons that I learned about, about being truly rich. As I got there, I saw riches in a totally different way. And these are the three lessons, and you can write it down, and then you can sit down in a second. I'll tell you when to sit down after I pray. But these are the lessons that I learned. One is you can be poor but be truly rich. You can be poor but truly rich. They're rich in a different way, and this is what's going to happen. They're going to share their riches with us. We're going to share their, our riches with them. They're rich in a different way. We're rich in a different way. It's going to come together and be a perfect marriage. Are you ready to receive what they have? We're going to receive it. I also learned you could be poor and be rich, truly rich, and you could be rich and be truly poor. So we're going to talk about that. You can, and, and this is the third lesson I learned, that if you help the poor, you will be rich. If you help the poor, you will be rich. So let's pray and let's get into the word of God. I'm going to show you a few videos of the little boys and little girls. There's a lot of things that happen in just right around 12 days. Their lives have never been, will never be the same. Our lives will never be the same. Our church will never be the same. These kids and these pastors and these people are now our family. They're your, they're your Ugandan cousins, brothers and sisters. Come on. That's what's happening. So, Father, we just thank you for this time that we have to study your word. And I'm asking you, Lord, to speak through me today. Speak to our churches that today our lives will be transformed as we're hearing your word. We're not here just to come. We're not here to be, come to, to be entertained. We are coming as students to learn. Transform our thinking. Transform our hearts. And those that don't know you quite yet, I thank you, Lord, that they will have, they'll use the faith that they do have, the faith that they used to get in this building to receive the true riches of heaven. That they'll receive eternal life. They'll receive the joy of God. They will see, receive, Father, the purpose that you have for them. So I just thank you, Lord, for a new day, a new life. Our best days are ahead of us. And I thank you, Lord, that our church will never be the same after this exchange and this covenant that we've entered into with the Ugandan church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We went to Uganda thinking that we were actually taking over a church and actually also taken over 60 churches. What we found when we got there, it wasn't just the church. Of course, there was an orphanage. 
And the orphanage has increased in kids in the last week as well. We also, were, we also received way more than we thought. It wasn't just 60 churches. It turned into right around 140 churches. Now, pastors showed up from all over Uganda. Now, for them to show up from all over Uganda was not easy because none of the pastors even have a car. So we, we had to organize it. We got transportation that we paid for, and we went through all the villages, some of them five hours away, and we, bought, we brought vans full of pastors. They walked there. They came in through the vans. They, they, some of them came on, on, on the back of a motorcycle. They all came from all over Uganda, and not 60 pastors showed up. It was over 140 pastors. They showed up. They showed up to hear what we were going to say. They, they were hoping to hear something they never heard. What ended up happening after I preached and we taught a little bit, all 140 pastors sign a covenant that there will be a Way World Outreach Church. We went from nine churches to now 148 churches in one week. This is bigger growth than we could ever imagine. These pastors are committed. These pastors are men and women of God. These pastors know the word of God. They are sold out brothers and sisters. I can't wait for one day for you to hear some of the pastors that are in Uganda that are going to preach to our churches. They preach with fire. They know the word of God. They are excited to be part of the Way World Outreach family. They are super grateful. They were waiting for a church like us to come. After I preach, the pastors came up to me, some of the top leaders, and said, we, had, our faith in the American church has been restored. We've had pastors visit us from America, and they give resources, but this is what they said about the pastors of America. The pastors of America are dead after I preached over there and they heard the word of God, they couldn't believe it. They told me this, you preach like an African. You are on fire. He goes, are all the churches in America like yours? I go, no, we're probably very unique. But we came with fire. People were getting delivered, set free. The power of God invaded that room. And every single pastor went into covenant with us. Let's give a praise to God for an expansion that was supernatural. Now, this all started with a word that God gave us at the beginning of the year. God gave us a prophetic word. Nothing changes until you receive a word from God. I'll give you an example. The Bible says in the beginning, the earth was without form. It was dark and void. That means it was, there was nothing there until God said, let there be light. And when he said, let there be light, there was light. What I mean by that is you could talk about your problems and the darkness and your past and every bad thing that's ever happened to you and it won't change your life. You could be a victim for the rest of your life. The reason is, the reason I am the way I am because this happened to me and uses as an excuse to not fulfill the greatness in your life. But there has to be a time that you no longer talk about your problems. You no longer talk about your, your, the pain, the suffering, everything you're going through, and you start speaking the solution. But if you could receive a prophetic word from God and begin to agree with heaven and start speaking what God is saying, you can start receiving what God has. So at the beginning of this year, we were seeking God and said, what, what's your word for our church? And I just want to give you a little synopsis of what was said so we understand that us going to Uganda was prophetically spoken and now we're seeing the manifestation of what God spoke and then we spoke. What God spoke and then what we spoke. What God spoke and then what we believed. What we believed, we received. Understand if God is doing it for us, he can do it individually for you. And this was the word that God gave us. This year will be a year of supernatural growth because of the favor that I have placed over your life. Areas that have been barren and unfruitful 
will begin to produce and create a mighty harvest. Do not be afraid of dreaming big. Do not be afraid of dreaming big. Do not be afraid of dreaming big. Do not be afraid of dreaming get big. Do not be afraid of dreaming big. Do not be afraid of dreaming big because, this is what God says, I am a God that has no limits. I am a God that has no limits. Remember, all things are possible for those who believe. I have promised you that it will give you infinitely more than you can ask or think according to my power that is work within you. The growth will come with specific instructions. If you follow the step-by-step -step instructions I will give you, you will see a release of my favor that will cause mega growth. Get ready to do more this year. Get ready to do more this year than you've done your whole life. This was a word that God gave us at the beginning of the year. And when I spoke it, there's some people that believed and they're seeing a manifestation in their lives. And there's some people that were doubting. But understand this. We said it. We agreed with it. We didn't know how it was going to happen. Our job is not to make it happen. Our job is to believe it and God makes it happen. So we spoke it. We did not know that Uganda was going to open up. We have over 100 churches now that are part of our church, the Way World Outreach. We have a vision that we're going to have over 1,000 churches that are going to join us in Uganda. Right now, there's pastors calling all over Uganda that they want to be part of the way. This is what's going to happen. The Way World Outreach is going to be through Uganda. All the way through Uganda, we are going to begin to disciple people in a way they've never been discipled before. We're going to empower these pastors to be able to succeed, be able to get out of poverty, be able to sustain themselves. But while I was there, I got a, this is what I started seeing. What's true riches? So I want to share this, these three lessons with you. The first lesson I learned was you can, you can be poor but be truly rich. And this is, what the, this is the point. We can be poor, but rich in faith. Say it with me. Poor, but rich in what? I found people that were poor, but they were rich in faith. In James 2, 5, it says this. My dear brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom? He has promised to those who love him. This is what he's saying. I will transfer all of my wealth. I will transfer heaven for those that realize that they need me. The poor might not have, they might not be rich by worldly standards, but they're rich in faith. While I was there, I saw people that were real believers. Now, for the church to be full on that Sunday, the church was absolutely full to the point that they had to start saying no to some pastors that were willing to travel miles because they weren't sure that we had enough room. Every chair in there, they had some chairs that the church bought, and then we rented a whole bunch of other chairs, and we filled every one of the chairs. Now, understand, a church filled in America is different because you have transportation, you got a car, some of you guys got a motorcycle, you could get the bus. But these people, for them to show up to church, they have to use some real faith. Many of them walk for miles with their little children and dusty roads to show up to church. You could see that they're dressed very well, but many of them live in huts. They have no running water. The floors in their homes, the majority of these people, are mud floors. They don't have bathrooms like we have. They have a hole in the ground. And for them to show up to church, it took a lot of preparation. They'd wake up early, early Sunday morning, get their kids ready. This is real faith. They don't let nothing get in the way of their worship with God. We as Americans, we need to become more rich in faith. That we don't allow a little cold, a little struggle, a flat tire, stop us to come into the house of God. What well, God is saying, I want to give their riches to you because I'm ready to do a big thing in America, a big thing in Uganda, but we're going to need some faith. And he says that he has chosen to give his inheritance 
to those who are poor but rich in faith. God says, everything I have, I'm going to give to those who are rich in faith. Be careful that you're not rich and poor in faith. They showed up. Today's Hurricane Sunday. There's people tuning in. I'm proud of you. You showed up. I'm proud of you. You're not letting a hurricane get in your way. I know we're, I, we don't know what a hurricane is in the United States, but understand, we didn't use it as an excuse. We are here. We are tuning in. Let's give God some praise. But our faith is being raised. Don't be rich and poor in faith because they're poor and they're rich in faith. And we're rich as Americans. The average, the average Ugandan has no jobs. How they live is they eat from farming. None of the pastors have a job. A lot of the pastors, they need to, they can't even send their kids to school because they have no money. Over there, there is no public school system. Either you got money to send your kids or you don't. So a lot of these kids are at home and the pastors are struggling because they don't have any extra money to send their kids to school. But we're believing that they're going to get to the point that they'll have enough money to meet their needs, enough food to eat, and then also leftover to share with somebody. This is what I've learned what rich is. Rich is all your needs being met and having a little bit left over to share with somebody else. So anybody could be rich. And whatever needs that you have, God wants to meet. It could be emotional. It could be financial. God wants to meet it, but he just doesn't want to meet your need. He wants to bless you to the point that you receive a blessing and you give a blessing. While I was there, this is what I found, that they were rich in faith. They weren't poor. They weren't rich and yet poor in faith. In Matthew 16, 26, it says you could be rich and be poor in faith. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, wealth, fame, success, but forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Think about this. Could it be that you're so rich that you think you don't need God? Because if that's the condition you're in, you're going to be in really preparing for a rude awakening. Just because you have a car and just because you got extra money and just because you have a lot of money in the bank doesn't mean that you're right with God. Don't mistake the blessing upon your life that you're actually right with God. People in America, we're the richest nation in the world and we have now taken our riches for granted. And we become rich in material things but impoverished in the spiritual things. We are no longer passing our faith on to the next generation. We are a, gener a generation that have lost the good news of the gospel in our mouths. The churches have become dead. We're not passing our faith to our kids. We're letting demons come into our homes. Depression has taken over. We're in bondage. We're addicted. And we're saying that we're rich. But God is saying, be careful that you've gained the whole world and you have every material thing, but you're bankrupt emotionally, you're bankrupt spiritually, and you have no faith. God is saying, I want you rich in the sense your needs are met, but most of all, I want you rich spiritually. How crazy would it be that you have everything in this life and you're lost for eternity? Be careful that you're not living for the present and have not prepared for your eternity. You lost your soul. Not only did you lose your soul, your kids lost their soul because they were following you. You have a big responsibility. Be rich in faith. Use the little faith you have. Put your faith in Jesus that after you leave here, you can't take your money with you. You can't take your house with you. You can't take your 401k with you. You can't take your hobby with you. You can't take your motorcycle with you. You can't take your low rider with you. You can't take your business with you. But you can take your relationship with God with you. So make sure that you leave this earth with the riches of heaven. Store up your treasures in heaven, not here on earth. Because everything here on earth, you're going to leave here. Right? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? So be careful 
Don't be rich, but yet poor in faith. This is what I found out about them as well. They were poor, but they were rich in generosity. The word generosity means liberal and giving and sharing. It looked like they had nothing. But the things that they had had not taken over their heart to share. They were not thinking, I have a little, so I have to hold on to it. They were thinking, the little I have, I need to share it. I met a pastor on the way to an island that we were going to. Our church years ago built part of a school in an island in Uganda, Buvama Island. And we were going to check out the school that we built. But on our way, I met a young man. His name was Mark. And I told him, my name's Mark Co. I go, you're Mark and I'm Mark Co. And the reason I found out he was a Christian, because as I was sitting there, I said this, once in a while, a praise just escapes me. It just comes out of my mouth. I don't accidentally cuss, I accidentally praise. So it was just overflowing, and I just was sitting there, and I was thinking about the Lord, and I said this out loud. I thought I was just saying it to myself, and I said, hallelujah. And when I said hallelujah, he was sitting right in front of me. He goes, hallelujah. I go, you're a believer? He goes, I'm a believer, and I'm a pastor, this young man. His name's Mark. He's 24 years old. But understand this, a 24-year-old in Uganda is not a 24-year-old here. They are men at 15 years old. They have to take care of themselves. They have to take care of family. They have to work the farm. They have to go to work. And they wake up early before the sun rises. There's no sleeping in in Uganda. The whole culture wakes up before sunrise. So I met, I met Mark and I go, Mark, what are you doing? And he had a bag. I go, what's the bag? He goes, this bag is, is pumpkin seed. I go, what are you doing with it? He goes, I'm going to the island. My, my grandfather gave me some land and I'm working the land. So I'm going to plant some, I'm going to plant some pumpkin. And I asked him, well, how do you eat? He goes, I eat off that land. Everything it produces is how I feed my family. Without that land, there is no grocery stores I go to. I feed my family from that land. I'm planting pumpkin seed. In a few months, I'll have pumpkins to share with my family. So I asked Mark, I go, Mark, what do you do when you have extra? Like you're, you're planting bananas, pumpkins, you can't eat all that. He goes, I take it back to the church. And I feed the, the, the elderly, the widows that have no one to take care of them. They can't farm anymore. They don't have the energy. I, I share with the orphans. So every, all the extra I have, I give it to the church. We're talking about generosity. He doesn't sell it. This is what he does. He gives it. So be careful that you're not rich and poor in giving. How crazy would it be that you stand before God and you accumulated all kinds of wealth, but you were poor in being generous. You are poor if you have and you can't share. How poor are you? Well, I was, I was with him for a few minutes. He told me right away. He goes, Pastor, can I give you a gift? What he wanted to do was give me a package of his bananas, his fruit, his vegetables from that island. And he wanted to give it to me that day. He goes, I'm going to the island. I want to give it to you. I told him I'm leaving tomorrow. I can't use it. But thank you so much. He, I think he thought I could take it on the plane with me. But the idea was the little he had, he shared I, know, I go, Mark, I go, what's your vision? He goes, my vision is to preach the gospel throughout the whole world. I go, Mark, I'm proud of you. He goes, yes, I got saved. Jesus visited my room and he spoke to me, said, Mark, you're supposed to preach. You're my preacher. The next day I went to church and I started sharing my testimony. God started using me to heal people, save people. And now, I, this is what he does right now, Mark. But it looks like he has nothing. Every Monday, after he got saved, he takes 70 young adults on the streets for 12 hours straight. He wakes up at 5 o'clock in the morning, 
has a prayer time with his team. They hit the streets. They evangelize. They share the good news of Jesus Christ. And they invite them to a service at 2 o'clock. They have a garden. It's just a field. They bring everybody that they minister to that day into that field. They have a worship service. They help people get saved. They preach the gospel. He goes, every Monday from 5 to 5, we're out there preaching the gospel. This young man might not have much, but he's generous with what he has. This is what we're missing in sometimes in an American church. We're quick to receive, but we think it ends there. They don't believe that I get saved to sit. They believe I get saved to be sent. While I was preaching, I got an opportunity to preach on the radio all across Uganda, two stations. And as I preached, somebody called in because we had a call in and they were calling in. And one of the guys said, he's from a village. We asked him, what's your request? And this is what he says. After I heard your message, I want to give my life to Jesus. But this is what he says. I want to give my life to Jesus, and then I want to preach the gospel everywhere. He didn't just say, I want to give my life to Jesus. He goes, I want to give my life to Jesus, and everything I'm receiving, I want to give. They understand there's a purpose. Let's be more like that. Be poor, but generous. Don't be rich, but poor in generosity. And Proverbs 11:24 says this. One person gives freely, yet gains more. One person gives freely and what? Gains more. Another withholds what is right and only becomes poor. A person that has and doesn't share with the poor is truly poor. The goal is to be rich and generous, not just be rich. While we went there, um, there's a picture here. And you're going to see a little bit of, of the picture. Some bananas. And a chicken. So there's, a, but it's bigger than that. There's a chicken over there, right on the top. This lady came walking for miles with heavy bananas and a chicken to bring to church to have an offering. She's poor, but she's rich. Her bananas don't own her. Her chicken doesn't own her. She is a worshiper. And when you become a worshiper, you can't help but share what you have. But more, you're more blessed to receive. Come on. You're more blessed to give than to receive. She already know. I, I got a little, but I'm going to give my little to God and make sure I got, I got bananas and I got chickens, but someone else is going to get some bananas and someone else is going to get some chickens and I'm going to be a blessing to somebody else. So don't be rich. And poor when it comes to generosity. So we seen that I, there was a lady, a widow, as I was preaching, she was so grateful by hearing the message that she came up with the little money she had and she put it in my hand while I was preaching. I'm not going to say no to her because this was her act of worship. She was being generous. And for, for them, money is a huge deal because they have no jobs. For her to get that money was a miracle, and she was willing to give her miracle to us. I talked to Mark, the pastor, and, and I asked him, share your vision. And this is what he told me. I go, I go you have a kid. Does your kid go to school? She goes, my daughter. He goes, you have my, I have a daughter, and my daughter goes to school. I go, how do you pay for the school? He goes, I get fish from the fishermen. I buy it from them, then I go to town, and I sell it for a little more, and then I get enough money to pay for my daughter's school. I go, do you have other bills? He goes, yeah, I got one more bill. It's my rent. I go, so how do you pay your rent? He goes, the same exact way. I go, so you make enough selling the fish to pay the rent? He goes, yes. I go, but what's your vision? He goes, I want to have two goats and two cows. He goes, if I have two goats and two cows, I could have a business. Because I could have little goats that I could sell. I could have milk from the cow. And, if the, and, and as the cow has little calves, I could sell those too. And then I could make sure that I not, not only have enough for schooling, I could have more left over to share with others. Come on, that's a vision from God. So you know what we did? Because we had a little money with her. 
we bought the two golds. So he, he now has two golds. Half of his vision is already happening. And I believe we're going to, come on, we're going to buy him the two cows. Mark is not going to just have just enough because he's connected with a church that just not, is not just rich, but we're rich in generosity. Give God some praise if that's you. Now, I want to, the word generous, I want to just cover that for just a second. It means liberal and giving or sharing. Unselfish. This is a lesson that we try to teach our little boys and little girls in preschool and the kindergarten. Share. So when you're generous, you share what you have. You can't go to Uganda and to these countries without adjusting your life. I started thinking about wasted money in my life. I started thinking about the excess and I said, you know what? I need to cut back on stuff so I could be more generous. Amen. There's a kid that right now, because of our generosity, he can actually go to school. They can have a little dignity of having their own school uniform. These kids have nothing. But when they get a uniform, they wear it with pride. The little boys and little girls are five, six, seven years old. They wake up before sunrise to go to school. Their moms don't take them. They don't have a BMW to drop them off. They walk to school for miles as little boys and little girls in their little uniforms. There's some of the kids that are so poor, they couldn't get the uniform. But now that they're with us, we're going to make sure the little boys and little girls, all of them have a uniform. And what we're going to do is open schools in Uganda so more of those little boys and little girls can get an education. Let's give God some praise that we get to be generous, rich and generous. This little boy we rescued off the street, his name's Johnny. His mom died. His dad died. He had no one to take care of him. He showed up at the church, and I, I, I talked to John. I go, Johnny, how can I help you? He goes, I'm hungry. Now, understand, we could say yes to him, or we could say something silly, like we'll pray that God gives you food. We did, we won up them. We not, we, what we did was we brought them to our hotel, and we told them, order anything you want on the menu. He was the first time ever that he was in a restaurant and we gave him whatever he wanted and then we brought him in to our orphanage. We bought him a bed that night. We even got him a bicycle. He's never had a bicycle. So right now, little Johnny is not on the streets because there's a rich and generous church in the United States of America and it's saying yes to little Johnny. How can we say no to Johnny? Now, it would be scary if you have a 12-year-old that's living on the streets. He was not scared at all. He knew that the rescuer came. Jesus sent us. He'll never have to worry again. Johnny's not in school. We're going to make sure that he enrolls in school. He gets an education. That young man is going to be a blessing. He's not going to grow up to be a criminal. He's not going to grow, grow up thinking nobody loves me because there's a church that God has called to Uganda to make sure we're saying yes to little Johnny. One gives freely, yet gains more. Understand this. The third lesson on this is that you can't give to the poor and not become rich. What I mean by that is, if you give to the poor and you give your life to give it to the poor, God will make sure that you'll never lack anything in your life. You'll always have enough and you have always a little bit or a lot left over to share some, somebody else. Let's make sure that we're not storing up our treasures just here on earth. Make sure we're storing up our treasures in heaven, that our time on earth, our money on earth is making an eternal impact. Give God some praise. Come on, little Johnny has been rescued because somebody went all the way to Uganda to say yes to him. He was on the streets, hopeless. He thought everybody left him. His mom died. His dad died. But there was a church that went all the way from California to Uganda. Uganda, we said yes. Now, this is what I also realized. They were poor, yet rich in faith. They were poor, but rich in generosity. But I also found 
They were poor, but they were rich in joy and praise. This is what they said. My temporary affliction and lack cannot conquer my faith, joy, and praise. The richest person in this room is not the one that has the most money. The richest person in the room is the one that has the greatest amount of peace, joy, hope, and praise. Is there anybody in this room that even though you've been going through a tough time, you've been going through a difficulty, it looks like everything's falling apart, but there's something still in you. It has not conquered all the trouble, all the affliction, all the trials, everybody coming against you has not conquered your faith, has not conquered your praise, has not conquered your hope. Is there anybody here that can have a praise in the middle of affliction, in the middle of a battle? Give God some praise. Let the devil know you thought you had me, but you don't. There's still a praise in me. Now, something happened to these little boys and little girls. But before I, say, before I t show you a video of what happened to them, I want to re read you a scripture about being poor but rich in praise. In Psalms 40 verse 17, it says, While those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you, may those who long for your salvation always say, the Lord is great. Say it with me. The Lord is great. Say it with me. They seek you and they're glad. Someone say they're glad. Who are the ones that are glad? In verse 18. Though I'm afflicted and poor, my Lord keeps me in mind. I've not lost, lost my focus. I might be afflicted. Everybody might have turned against me. Maybe nobody believes me. I've been left as an orphan. The person I married has been betrayed me. They've left me. They've abused me. They're gone. My parents weren't there. But this is what I know. I may be afflicted and I might be struggling, but this is the truth. I've not lost focus. Everybody might be gone, but I'm going to confess it right now. I've not been abandoned because the Lord is with me. The Lord is great. Though I'm afflicted and poor, the Lord keeps me in mind. Lord, I'm going to praise you. Lord, you're my help. Lord, you're my deliverer. You're my God. Father, I'm waiting on you. Do not delay. I still have hope. Is there anybody here that's gone through hell, but hell has not conquered your praise, has not conquered your faith? You're poor, but you're rich in praise, and you're rich in joy. Be careful that you're not rich in monetary things, but emotionally bankrupt. You got everything that money can buy, but you have nothing that money can't buy. Money can't buy peace. Money can't buy joy. Money can't buy eternal life. And God is saying, be careful that you're not depressed. You should be praising God for the little that you have. Because compared to a lot of people, you got way more than them. You got a job. Come on, you got a car. You got here. You got breath. You're in the richest nation in the world. The United States of America. What has conquered your praise? What has conquered your joy? I still believe in you. Don't be rich, but emotionally poor. Revelation 3.17 says, You say I am rich. I, given, I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. But that's, doesn't that sound like America? I don't got time for church. I got to go to casino. I don't got time for church. I got to go to the river with my sea dues. I don't got time for church. I got to go see a movie. Sundays is my day. I don't need a thing. I don't need to go to church. Church is for weaklings. I'm self-made. I don't need God. I, you know, that, that's really cool until you can't breathe anymore. 
You forgot who gave you a brain. You forgot who gave you talent. You forgot the one that gave you the breath. Understand, it's all cool until you get into reality. One day you're going to breathe your last breath, and you can say you don't need them. But the truth is, you do need them. And any blessing you got, thank God, the God above that created you, and give him some praise. Thank God for the little you got or the lot you got. Don't forget where it came from. I don't need a thing. Hmm. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's major deception that you think you're okay, but you're actually in a mess. Miserable. The truth is Americans overall are miserable. We're more depressed than anybody. Suicide is the second cause of death among young people. These little Ugandan kids and teenagers say, what are you dying for? We would love to go to America and you're willing to die. And I'll tell you why. Because we have everything, but we're miserable. And your money can't give it to you. A, a promotion can't give it to you. A boyfriend can't give it to you. Sex can't give it to you. Come on. A car can't give it to you. A hobby can't give it to you. A video game can't give it to you. We, come on. The casino can't give it to you. Your, come on. Your husband can't give it to you. Your wife can't give it to you. Your kids can't give it to you. There's only one that can give you what you're looking for. There's only one that can make you whole. There's only one that can make you have some peace. There's only one that can give you a good night's sleep. There's only one that can give you eternal life. And his name is Jesus. Come on. Praise him one more time. I'm preaching like an African. Miserable. These kids, these orphans, two years ago, there's some rebels from Congo that came in. They broke through the security gate at our orphanage. And they put all the kids under. But there was a little boy, they put chloroform, he, he wouldn't go under. He started crying as these guys came in and started stealing everything they got. These poor orphans, that's them, they went right through those gates. They didn't know that they were going to have the most tragic night of their life. They have a little van that they have there. And the van driver that drives the orphans around, he wouldn't give up the van. So these rebels came in. And they macheted him to death. The little boy that wouldn't go under, he began to cry as he was seeing it. And they began to beat him and beat him and beat him. Knocked out all his teeth and left him for dead. They raped three of the girls in our orphanage. I don't know which three of those girls were raped. And I couldn't tell because every single one of them, they were poor and afflicted, but they still had praise and they still had joy and they still had peace. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see which one it was because even though they were attacked, even though they went through hell, the, the hell did not take over their emotion. They turned to God and God heals the brokenhearted. I'm telling you, there's no tragedy that you can go through that you can't get healed of. It starts with a miracle in your heart and faith in Jesus Christ. So now, they might have went through that, but they didn't conquer their praise and their joy. The little boy that got his teeth knocked out, we were there having a birthday party for all the kids. We weren't there. It was the first time we met them. We don't know when their birthdays were, but we bought a big, huge cake. We bought some candy, and we just started singing, we started singing happy birthday to all of them. A lot of those kids don't even know when they were born anyways. They know nothing about that. So we sang happy birthday and all of a sudden the little boy that his teeth got knocked out, he started singing a song, a praise to God by himself. And then everybody began to join him. Take a look at this 
It's in the living room of this house. He begins to praise God. The kid, without any teeth, he doesn't have his teeth back, but he, but he has his praise back. That's him in the red. What are they singing? Oh Lord, we thank you for all that you have done. This is just reminding us that I know you've gone through stuff, but there's an ability through the power of Jesus that you put his faith in him to have a praise after the tragedy, to have a celebration after the tragedy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Is anybody here want to praise like them? God is saying, you haven't gone maybe what they've gone through. Where's your praise at? Come on, America. Come on, Way Royal Outreach. Where's your praise at? Come on, he got his teeth knocked out. He saw a murder, but still, he said, Lord, I want to thank you for all you've done. You sent these people all the way from America. We're not alone. You love us. God is saying, if you can praise me, you will see me come and show up and invade your home, invade your marriage invade your future give God just one more praise I might be poor but I'm rich in praise so this is your time to say yes Jesus said in John 10 10 my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life God wants to, for you to be rich, that all your needs are met physically, emotionally, relationally, so you can have some sleep. Any area of lack, God is able to fill it with his abundance. But I want to give you a rich and abundant life because I want you to receive my blessing, receive my love, receive my forgiveness, and to give it to others. These little boys and little girls, after that tragedy, they forgave their perpetrators. They never got caught. They were never arrested, but they forgave. They were not only generous in their praise, but they were generous in their forgiveness. God's a super generous God. You don't have to beg him. He wants to do it. When someone's generous, they're more than willing. God's not here to judge you, put you down. He's here to forgive you. He wants to give you a purpose. Well, see, you say use your little faith and give it to God and receive everything he has. Be rich in faith today. Use what you have. Or maybe you're in this place and say, God, make me generous. Help me to say yes to the poor and the hurting around me. How much say yes to the vision of this church to reach those that have been forgotten and lost, not only in Uganda, but here in America. We got men's homes, women's homes, and it, it's not easy. It's difficult. It's a lot of hard work. A lot of things behind the scenes that you know nothing about, but it's war. But we do it and we invest because we love them. And if we don't intervene, they die on the streets, overdose. They're lost, they never find their purpose, they're never healed, they never have joy. And this is a reality, someone has to step in. I wanna give you one last picture here. And, and these are little boys and little girls. We ended up purchasing a, purchasing a school over there that was in front of our church, right in front of our church. The church has an auditorium that fits maybe a thousand people in it, but they have nothing for the children. But right in front of the church, it's not much, but there was a school in front of the church with little boys and little girls. And when we walked on the property, the little boys and little girls ran out of the classroom and the teacher says, they want to sing to you. Will you let them sing to you? So they all came out in their little dirty uniforms with a smile on their face, not wanting anything. They want to share. This is who we're saying yes to. We could say no, we could say yes. So we 
ended up purchasing the school, the property. The buildings aren't much right now, but we could send teams, missionary teams, to put floors in them, put some windows in them, make them beautiful, get these kids all nice uniforms, and we could expand the school to older ages. How many believe we could say yes to all of it? So take a look at these little kids. They're not singing to us only. They're singing to you today, all the way from Uganda, Africa. They're now your family and your children. They were ready to shut down this school until we came. Those little boys and little girls actually walked to school miles and miles on dusty roads with cars and sometimes bikes passing right by them really fast. They show up to school, they learn this song that they love Jesus and they want to share it with us. If these little boys and little girls could have a praise in them and they could worship, I think we could receive a lot from the Ugandan church. I think we could give them a lot, but understand, they're rescuing us as much as we're rescuing them. How many believe we're going to be a better church because of our trip to Uganda? Let's give God one more praise. Now, now we're at a point of decision. This has to happen. Jesus knocks at your heart's door and says, I want to give you a rich and satisfying life. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You're emotionally bankrupt. You don't seem like you have a purpose in your life. And you're going to get an opportunity right now to open your heart and say, God, save me. I don't want to be that person that gained the whole world and chasing after the dollar and chasing after the things. And at the end, I lost my soul forever. Help me to prioritize my life. Or maybe you're emotionally bankrupt today. You've gone through so much. Understand, don't be ashamed of it. We've all gone through it. Losses, pain, hurt, disappointments, discouragement. It's life. But God is saying, come to me, all that are tired and worn out. And I'll heal your broken heart. I'll give you some rest for your soul. Not always does your situation change immediately. But your emotions can be healed. And it happens in a moment, like right now. You can say yes to Jesus. And you trade in your depression. You trade in your fears. You trade in your grief. You trade in the nightmares. You trade in your sleepless life. And you receive the peace of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, the joy of the Lord. You could, it's a real thing. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You're seeing the miracle of that here. Kids that have nothing. Kids that were abused. A nation praising God with everything they got. How? They're rich. And they receive their riches from their Father in heaven. And you can receive it today. Now God doesn't just want to heal your emotions and give you his joy, his peace. He wants to give you purpose. There's people in your family. The devil's convinced you you're nothing. You have no purpose. You're a failure. Nothing's going to change. That's the way you are. And God is saying, that's a lie. Stop believing it. Stop confessing it. I'm going to give it to you. And why don't you be like that young man that says, I want to preach the gospel throughout the world. I want to share what God has given me. And stop letting people get in your way. Stop letting yourself get in the way. Stop letting circumstances get in the way. Stop saying, when this happens, I'll do it. And God says, no, now. Why don't you surrender your life now? I will nourish you as you nourish others. As you bless them, I'll bless you. Does anybody want to say yes to purpose today? I'm ready to let it go. Some of us need to let our finances go. And you have to be willing to give finally. Because you're rich, but you're very poor. You can't give to nobody. You think everybody's trying to get a dollar from you. And God said, I don't want your money. I want your heart. But if I could get your heart, I'll get you everything you've ever wanted. 
And understand, if God doesn't have your heart, he can't even get to your kids. It's a big, big deal. Some people love money so much that they'll forfeit their soul, but they'll forfeit the souls of their children as well. Because if God can't get to you, he can't get to your children. Or maybe you're in this place to say, God, I, if I were to die right now, I'm lost. I got good news for you. Salvation is the moment. If you put your faith in Jesus, he'll forgive you and he'll give you new life. It's real. God's presence comes inside of you. I'm going to count to three. And I want you to respond. Faith without action produces nothing. If you don't act on your faith, nothing's going to happen. Be careful that you're not more concerned about what people think than just getting right. Who cares what the person next to you thinks? When you stand before God, you're going to stand before God by yourself. Did you actually fulfill your purpose? God's knocking at your heart's door. Will you open your heart and say yes? So today, first question. He said, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. I, I could be in that category that if I, I gain a lot, but I think my soul is lost. I'm not confident if I were to die right now, I'd go to heaven. I believe that God exists, but I've never totally committed my life to him. Today's your day. He's knocking at your heart's door. And if you open your heart's door by faith, and say yes. When I'm going to count to three, I'm going to have you raise your hand. When I say three, you're going to raise your hand. If you want to receive Jesus, you want to receive eternal life, you want to receive forgiveness, God's spirit will come inside of you and make you a new person. It can happen right now. You can open the door or close it. Number two, you said, Pastor, I'm emotionally bankrupt. I'm depressed. I'm full of anxiety. I'm overwhelmed. Some of you feel like dying. And God's saying today, you're emotionally bankrupt. Let me give you a rich and satisfying life. I want to heal your broken heart. I want to take your depression from you, set you free, and to give you my joy and peace. The joy of the Lord is my strength that can happen right now. Or the third thing is, you're saying, Pastor, I feel like I'm going to live in a life of purpose. I want to give everything to God. My life, my finances, God bless me. I want to commit to a life of ministry today, serving others. When I say three, if you're in any one of those categories, I want you to raise your hand. You cannot get saved without saying yes. One. And when I say three, raise your hand and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be healed emotionally. I want to start serving God with everything I have. I'm no longer waiting. Today's my day to commit to ministry. Today's my day to commit my life to Jesus. Today's my, my day to get healed and set free. Two, when I say three, I want you to raise your hand. Three, raise your hands all over this building. I want to give my life to Jesus. I see that hand there. I see those hands over there. I see the hand over there. I see the hand there. I'm proud of you. Come on, anybody else? I see those hands way in the back. I see those hands. Anybody else? I said, I'm ready to surrender up. I see the hand. I see the hand. I see the hand. I see the hand. I want those to raise their hands. Can you stand up right where you're at? This is what you're saying. I'm not ashamed. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Can we all stand with them? I want those to raise their hands. I want you to do one more thing. Will you come up front with me? I want to pray with you. This is your step. You're leaving your old life in those seats. And you're starting a new life following Jesus. If you raise your hand, come forward right now. Surrender your life. This guy, like, getting married. You're coming up the aisle. I'm surrendering everything. Let's give him a hand as they're coming forward. Ask your neighbor. If you want to, ask your neighbor. If you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. There's somebody right now that's ready to come up. But they need, some, they need a friend to go up there with them. Ask your neighbor. If you want to go up there and give your life to Jesus, get healed emotionally, come on, let's go up together. We're in this together. Ask your neighbor. Bring him up. Let's give the Lord a hand I, online. Come on, stand up right where you're at. Get ready to receive. Proud of you guys. Come on up, baby. Proud of you. It takes a real man or woman to do this. Uh, parents, your kids need you to live for God. Understand, if you don't do it, they're not going to do it. It's more than you. And as you're saying yes right now, you're saying yes to more than you could ever believe. Some of you guys are going to actually be in Uganda with me. Mission trips all over the world. You're going to finally have some peace in your life. You're going to have some joy in your life. 
and you say, can you use me? God says, I'll use anybody that says yes to me. I got a plan for you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. It's time to end the emotional pain and hurt and get healed today. Do you believe that Jesus can set you free from depression, anxiety, fear, hopelessness? How many believe that God is a deliverer and he wants to give you what he has? It's a moment. But you're also making a decision to repent of your sins. You know what that means? You're no longer going to do it your way. You're no longer going to self-medicate. Some of your sins, you use them to numb you, to give you value. And God says, are you going to trust in your sin? You're going to trust in me. And you're thinking, man, can I give up that addiction? Of course you can. Who the son says free is free indeed. But, you, but he's not going to force you. You got to make a decision. Today's your day to surrender your life to Jesus and make a decision to follow him for the rest of your life. And if you give him your life, he's already made a decision. He'll give you his whole life, full inheritance, eternal life. When after we pray, you are forgiven. After we pray, you have eternal life. After we pray, God's spirit is going to come inside of you. And people are going to know because your life is going to change. I'm not saying that you won't have temptation, but I will tell you with the temptation, another voice is going to come and say, that's not for you no more. And you're going to have the strength to say no to what you couldn't say no to before. And say yes to what you couldn't say yes to before. Are you ready for the greatest Hurricane Sunday? Hurricane Sunday came through California and turned your world upside down. When did you get saved? Hurricane Sunday. Are you ready? The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead, and you confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. You receive eternal life. You become a child of God. Okay? You're going to receive forgiveness. You're going to forgive yourself. And then you're going to forgive everybody. You're going to leave in here with a guilt trip, shame. Freedom is your, your inheritance. Peace is your inheritance. Come to church. And I'm asking you this. After we pray, give us a year of your life. Keep coming every Sunday. Like you used to go. You used to go to a crack house every Sunday. We <laughs> used to go. We <laughs> used to go to the bar every Sunday. You used to go clubbing every uh, every all week long or weekends. Sometimes runs. You used to go to a casino all the time, movies all the time. And God is saying, "Don't be more dedicated to the devil than you are to me." Come on, come to church, join the classes, grow. I'm following Jesus. Let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes, repeat after me. Say, say, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. Today, I receive forgiveness. I believe that you're alive. You're knocking on my heart's door. I believe that you suffered. You died. You rose from the dead to pay the price for all my sins so that I could be forgiven. I receive forgiveness now. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Depression, I command you now to leave my life. Anxiety, I command you now to leave my life. Thoughts of giving up and hopelessness, I command you now to leave my life. I receive the power of your Holy Spirit in my life now. I receive joy, I receive freedom, I receive eternal life. I am saved. From this day forward, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Use me, Lord, to give everything that you've given me to, to today. You've given me today. I am saved. I'm born again. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big old hand. God bless you, church. Be safe out there. Don't drive crazy. I know we're not used to a little crazy weather. Don't rush to get home. You got the whole time. Kind of drive home safely. God bless you. Remember, church of God's for you. There's no one can come against you. You need prayer. Come on up. I want to make sure I need some more prayer people. I mean, prayer warriors here.